Well, welcome to another Bowen Theory Academy sponsored webcast. This one is entitled The Neuroscience of Differentiation of Self. But I caution you the title is only accurate to a very limited extent. Not a great deal is known about that. Murray Bowen once posed a question to brain researcher Paul McLean. Do you think we will ever have a science of subjectivity? Paul did not answer the question. A Bowen theory includes subjectivity as part of emotional system functioning. So this uh, reason I'm presenting today, what I'm presenting is a recent article published by neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux and Daniel Pine of the NIMH. And I'm presenting this article because I think it has relevance to Dr. Bowen's question about subjectivity. Another reason I present this article is that it discusses some of the brain underpinnings of acute and chronic anxiety. It turns out, interestingly, I think, that somewhat different pathways are involved in the two types of anxiety response. The question is, can these different pathways help explain why human beings seem to have a harder time being aware of chronic anxiety than acute anxiety. And Bowen therapists realize that's a very important issue, trying to be more and more aware of chronic anxiety, and it's often elusive. So a final reason I'm doing this presentation is that the research I'm reporting may contribute to our understanding of the feeling system, which Bowen theory states that the intellectual system, which is presumably cortically based, is capable of registering superficial aspects of emotional system functioning through the feeling system. How the brain generates affect and feeling remains a mystery to neuroscience. Ledoux and Pine suggest it results from a not yet well-defined interplay between subcortical and cortical brain processes, which I believe would be consistent with what I just said about Bowen theory. So I got excited about this article because it's a step in the direction of better understanding subjectivity. So even though neuroscience has a very long way to go in making sense out of such an enormously complex organ as the human brain, if current findings in the field conflict with Bowen theory, conceptualizations such as solid self, pseudo-self, and no-self, or concepts like acute and chronic anxiety, it's obviously important for Bowen theory theorists to know about that. Now we'll go to the PowerPoints and I'll do this presentation with the aid of PowerPoint slides. First I decided to review what I think uh, Bowen theory has to say about differentiation of self. And this is sort of my take on it. I don't know that everybody in the Bowen Theory Network agrees uh, about what's involved in um, trying to raise or increase your level of solid self. And I've reduced, reduced it to certain key elements, the first of which would be getting exposed to systems ideas and engaging the idea of applying systems thinking to human behavior. This is so critically important, I think, to become acquainted with that because it's not out there in the culture at all, really. And so 
uh, gaining some confidence that this may be an interesting and important application is, I think, step one. Uh, and then gaining emotional objectivity by observing relationship processes such as reciprocity, triangles, and other patterns of emotional functioning, along with the recognition of the role of anxiety, always huge. It's the system's thinking that provides the lens to gain that objectivity, uh, where you can factually document the functional facts of, of a human interaction. Uh, it's not what people say about it. It's what you can watch and record, observe and record. The third element would be emotional neutrality that is derived from emotional objectivity. And I think it's the objectivity through systems thinking that leads to consideration of multiple variables, both in the here and now, and also looking into the multi-generational past, being involved in the explanation of a problem. It's the antithesis of cause and effect. So that the objectivity involves getting beyond blame and self-blame, and feeling states that are associated with that, such as guilt and anger, etc. And finally, action, I should say for self, that does not disrupt the relationship based on this new way of thinking. So that's, in a nutshell, the way I see it. It's applying systems thinking, gaining emotional objectivity in the process, associated with that because of the expanded perspective is more neutrality about the human condition, more tolerance, uh, less irritated by the way it is, uh, and action for self, though, is the key step. Putting that into action is what has the potential to build solid self, which depends on gaining a certain confidence and conviction in what you're seeing and doing. And that's a big part of solid self. It's, it's supported by emotion and, uh, in that way, I believe. OK, so now we're going to go to the neuroscience that I think is uh, lining up with what's involved in what I just described. And there's a picture of Joseph Ledoux. He's at NYU Medical School. And he wrote this with an MD, I assume a psychiatrist, uh, Daniel Pine, who's at NIMH and runs the Affective Disorder Research uh, section of the NIMH. So that came out just a few weeks ago, using neuroscience to help understand fear and anxiety a two-system framework that they're describing. Next one, please. So he points out early in the article that it's been long been assumed that an innate fear system in the mammalian brain that in response to a threat generates two things. One, a conscious feeling of fear, and two, the behavioral and physiological responses that an innate fear system uh, generates both of those, long been assumed. And that's what they're challenging. Next one, please. Um, and as you know, the amygdala, when it comes to fear and other emotions, which is shown there in blue, uh, down in the subcortical area of the brain, is uh, has been a thoroughly studied uh, brain uh, structure made up of a variety of 
different nucle nuclei, different parts. And that amygdala generally has been assumed, according to the some others um, I'll mention in a minute, people like Jak Panksepp, who has done a lot of work on the amygdala and the other emotional systems, uh, suggests that that is the structure responsible for, and it creates the subjective feeling state that goes with the emotion. And again, that's what these folks are challenging. Next one, please. So they're, they're saying there's a distinction exists between circuits underlying these two classes of responses that threats trigger that I mentioned before, the behavioral responses and the associated physiology that goes with that in the brain and body, and then also the conscious feeling states uh, reflected in self-reports of fear and anxiety by people. And that I knew was a has long been a very difficult, challenging thing for neuroscience, how to explain how subjectivity comes to be. And of course, in Bowen theory, we're very tuned in to subjectivity uh, as important to recognize and address. Next one, please. So conscious experience, again, this is their writing, is cognitively derived from non-conscious process that allows cortical regions to represent lower order information, meaning subcortical, and this re-representation re uh, enables conscious awareness of non-conscious processing about external stimuli. In other words, it's the it appears to be that consciousness is what has enabled us to tap into what's going on in the non-conscious sphere in response to external and internal stimuli. And that's, a, I think, an insight that's more and more accepted. Damasio argues for that heavily. and. Uh, David Eagleman, who I've quoted here before, another neuroscientist, now Ledoux. Um, but the, the, the non-conscious, and I think they purposely avoid the term unconscious to con not to conflate it with uh, Freudian ideas, to saying out of awareness, non-conscious. But they're essential for uh, what the cortical regions are doing and processing. They're taking that information and uh, representing it in higher brain and that that is useful as we, we know. Next one. So Elisa Feldman Barrett is a person, she's a psychologist up here in New England at Northeastern, which is in Boston. And um, Margaret Otto has had the foresight to invite her to be a speaker at the Heartland Conference uh, coming up early next year. And when I ran across Panksepp's, uh, excuse me, Ledoux's paper, it immediately made me think of what I have come to understand a little bit about Dr. Barrett, that it's very similar ideas, that she said her current projects, this comes off her website, focus on understanding the psychological construction of emotion. The psychological construction of emotion. In other words, how basic affective and conceptual agreements, ingredients, subcortical and cortical, in other words, provide the recipes for emotional experience. It's not just subcortical processes to be understood, it's also the interplay with cortical. Next one. So what is an emotion? Uh, this is a question she is very interested in. She says, our research addresses that question from both psychological and neuroscience perspectives. 
which I think is valuable, ultimately working toward a general framework for understanding how the brain creates the mind. So I just put her in because uh, Ledoux is not the only one, and, and, uh, and she's another important contributor. Next, please. So another possible title here is Toward a Science of Sub Subjectivity. Next one. And Murray Bowen and Paul McLean sat down to discuss their various ideas and research histories on a tape that we have at, had, that still exists at the Bowen Center in Washington. And in that tape, Dr. Bowen asked Paul, Paul, do you think we can ever have a science of subjectivity? At the time, I'm not sure I understood what Bowen was getting at, and maybe I still don't, but I think I understand it at least somewhat better than I did before. How do you make subjectivity into a science? And I think that's what people like Ledoux and Barrett are trying to do, to be able to explain psychological, cognitive processes, how they interplay with subcortical processes, such as from the amygdala, other parts of the so-called limbic system, to produce subjective states, which we as human beings, and again, the strength of Bowen theory can recognize as subjective and, and hold that idea, uh, distinguishing a belief, for example, that is 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 form far more related to one's internal feeling system versus the real world, and a belief that seems to be pretty much consistent with what we at least know at this point about the real world. That we can we can make that distinction, and as you know, Bowen held that as as the cornerstone of differentiation of self, that ability to distinguish between thoughts and feelings, to know the difference, objectivity and subjectivity. And that's what's made possible this effort towards a science of human behavior. Next one, please. So again, back to Ledoux and Fine. A pine, excuse me. Our theory of constructed emotions means how they're formed in the uh, in subjective experience. Hypothesizes that uh, emotions like anger, sadness, fear, and similar mental events are not basic basic building blocks of the mind, but instead are mental events that result from the dynamic interplay of more basic brain networks that are not themselves specific to emotion. <clears throat> Which I'll be showing is that the subcortical uh, elements of emotion are stimulating and triggering these kinds of building blocks that he's describing, they're describing here. Um, but they're not necessarily dedicated to emotion, and we'll come back to that again before we finish. Next one. So I've, I've often struggled with the various definitions of anxiety that are out there, uh, such as acute anxiety and chronic anxiety, which was the terms Bowen chose. And as you'll see here in a minute, Ledoux and Pine are fundamentally equating acute anxiety with fear and chronic anxiety with what they call anxiety, at least the way I would interpret it. And I, that, I found that very helpful. Bowen often didn't like to use the term fear. I'm not sure I know why. But um, the way they're using the term, I think, is absolutely consistent with um, acute anxiety described by Bowen theory. Next one. So they propose that the mental state term fear 
be used to describe feelings that occur when the source of harm, the threat, is either immediate or imminent. And that's slightly different than the way Bowen talked about acute anxiety. He talked about it. Acute anxiety has more to do with the reality threats. I mean, that can be a imagined threat, can be, can feel uh, immediate or imminent. But it also, I think, is very consistent with the idea of reality threats are immediate and or imminent, such as an approaching tsunami uh, or whatever, global warming. And uh, it's not, not really imminent, so it's not necessarily triggering fear. And the next uh, slide, please. And they propose the term anxiety to be used to describe feelings that occur when the source of harm is uncertain or distal in space and time. I think that's a useful distinction. Again, Bowen defined chronic anxiety as having more to do with imagined threats. And that would include things like anticipatory anxiety or the crime of chronic anxiety that global warming and other things like that can generate because they are sort of distant in space and time. So that's their distinction. And I think it just, uh, I like the fact that it's, I believe it is pretty much consistent with what Bowen proposed a long time ago. Next one. So this, the amygdala is a complex brain structure and it's it com composed of many nuclei. And you see them listed there, the lateral nuclei, the central, the medial, and then you have the basal nuclei, basomedial and basal, basal lateral. And then you also see cortical and hippocampal structures, which are not part of the amygdala, but they interact strongly with the amygdala and they're very important. So I'm just gonna take you through the sequence that they describe, next slide. So there's a, a perceived immediate threat. So right now we're talking about acute anxiety or fear. Next slide. And that uh, through uh, brain tracks goes to the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. Next one. And then that uh, translates it. Why does it this way? I don't know, but sends a message to the central nucleus of the amygdala. Next slide. And then that activates, the central nucleus is able to activate freezing behaviors and other defensive physiological reactions. But that's not the only thing the threat does and uh, when it's immediate. Next slide. The lateral nucleus also sends uh, stimuli to the basal uh, nucleus. I'm not sure how much it goes to the medial and how much to the basolateral, but to that large nucleus in the next one. And then that sends signals to another part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, and that that is important in avoidance behavior. So when you get the immediate threat, you get freezing behaviors, defensive physiological reactions, and avoidance behaviors. And those are the pathways that they've worked out for this. So that's going from the perception, psychological process of perception, which of course can be itself influenced by emotion or state, all the way uh, to the tracks to take it to uh, specific behaviors and physiological responses. Next one, please. And now I found this particularly interesting. I knew this before, but I didn't realize they were sort of pinpointing it as sharply as they are. So this obviously is a picture of the brain as if it's been the two halves of the brain, left and right, have been separated 
and you're looking here at, let's say, the right hand, right brain, and you're looking from the middle of the brain, and you don't see the far outside parts of the brain. So there, the subcortical circuits are modulated by certain cortical areas. And that's, again, inherent in the process of differentiation of self, that you use the cortical areas to self to regulate subcortical areas because when they're driving things it's going to keep things stirred up they have to be down regulated but also they mention that these uh, cortical areas that include the prefrontal cortex particularly the what you see there the ventromedial which means toward the bottom of the brain and inside, you see it in the inside, you don't see it on the outside. You see it in that half, the ventromedial pre prefrontal cortex. Um, that they, their activity, that activity in that area of the brain can actually extinguish, not repress, just extinguish a learned threat. And I put the emphasis on learned threat such as a sensitivity to a certain look on your parent's face. And that becomes a learned threat using systems thinking and gaining that objectivity that reduces threat and therefore the associated neutrality and the ability to take action, I think is what gives people a confidence that they can deal with things in the future and that that actually is valuable in information processing in the cortical brain to extinguish or at least dampen way down the learned threat. We know that can happen. But what I was excited about, here's an explanation for how it happens. And again, Bowen anticipated all this. I think in his mind, he imagined this is the way it worked. And now we're getting more and more evidence of, of the specifics of that. So there's a that pathway there from the ventromedial prefrontal cortex down to the amygdala, which can <coughs> shut down some of that response. Now, some people argue that there are more pathways going north than the subcortical brain to the cortical than coming south from the cortical to the subcortical, and that's why it's so hard to control. I mean, I can accept that may very well be the case, but I think we also know the threat is really the key factor. When you get very reactive to the a look on somebody's face that you consider disapproving, I mean, that's the threat, and that's a learned threat, your sensitivity to that. It's that threat that the information processing that you can do with systems eliminates or reduces. By again, by expanding the number of variables, understanding the reciprocity and how it developed, looking at it in the context of triangles, truly these things, as many of you know, can become more interesting than they are threatening. And that seems to be enough to activate these uh, pathways that can keep the amygdala under better control when you're in that context in the future. But of course, each situation has its things to learn about. So just doing it in one situation doesn't mean it's going to apply to all. Learn threats seem to be complex and uh, and somewhat relationship specific. Uh, next slide, please. The, uh, also, the hippocampus, which is involved in memory processing and short term memory, uh, can help inhibit amygdala functioning. So, you have from above a cortical influence from the ventromedial prefrontal cortex that can extinguish the reactivity, and you have the hippocampus from the subcortex itself 
that can provide inhibition. Again, then shutting down the vulnerability to going into these freezing or defensive physiological reactions, fight or flight, and also would be the avoidance part of it. Okay, next slide. Um, now this I found really interesting. I hope you do too, and I hope I'm making this clear enough that it seems worthwhile to listen to this. Um, because believe me, I've had my reservations about how much of the neuroscience do you present, but I tried to I'll put this on PowerPoint so you could sort of picture it in your mind. And when I'm reading, I mean, I'll often jump on the internet and go to, well, typically wind up in Wikipedia to try to understand the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. I mean, not most, most people don't know much about that if they've ever heard of it. And where is it in the brain and what does it do? And if you see at the top of that diagram, there's a, a box that says bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. And then there's a arrow that I've drawn onto this diagram to show specifically where in the brain that is. And if you follow from the amygdala, I don't have a way to point at that, but if you follow from the amygdala, you can see the pathway out of the amygdala that goes to the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. Um, and that's going to activate that stria terminalis. And then the stria terminalis, you'll see, has a, a track that goes to the hypothalamus. And that can activate the stress response, hypothalamic activity, and all the hormones uh, that go with that. But the point is the, the stria term, the bed nucleus, or the BNST as they call it, is engaged when threats are uncertain. This is a different pathway than the fear pathway related to acute anxiety, as I would see it. This one is related to chronic anxiety, and there's a different pathway seemingly at work in the brain in these two things, chronic versus acute anxiety. And, but that it can also activate behavioral inhibition and sort of taking stock of things. You're more vigilant, you're more leery, uh, you may not, the threat may be uncertain, it's like when you know you're going to go visit somebody that's difficult for you to deal with. You may have that unrecognized chronic anxiety running up to the event that you hardly even recognize. Apparently, this would be the pathway in the brain that's regulating that. Um, and the hypothalamus you know, is involved in activating the stress response. And for example, chronic inflammation that we see in disease states, this pathway to the BNST, as they call it, may be a critical one to understand. Now, drug companies are going to want to jump in with a drug to somehow interrupt that and be wonderful if they can do it. But Bowen theory has another way, which we're using our psychological process and knowledge of systems and direct work on relationships to tone down the degree of threat, which is key to the process of differentiation. Next one, please. So the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, according to Ledoux, is for chronic anxiety what the amygdala is for acute anxiety. It's two different pathways. Uh, in some instances, activating similar behaviors, but not necessarily exactly the same. Um, and I'd be curious to know if chronic inflammation is more active in uh, chronic anxiety than acute. Although it often comes in for acute anxiety, preparation for <clears throat> wound healing. And that's one 
speculation about why the stress response activates the inflammatory response. That if the person is going into battle or predator running and gets wounded, you want that system sort of mobilized to help heal. The next one, please. So the bed nucleus of the stria term analysis is the circuit hub out of which anxious feelings arise for chronic anxiety. So that's a distinction I was unaware of. The amygdala for the acute, the BNST for the chronic. And the implications of that, you know, I, I can't really say, but I think it, to me it seems like it's important. Next one. So the amygdala is not responsible for the experience of fear or acute anxiety. It detects and responds to present or imminent threats. That's what activates the amygdala. And that activates behavioral responses and physio associated defensive physiological responses that I mentioned earlier. Next one. And by the same token, the bed nucleus of the stria term analysis is not itself responsible for the experience of chronic anxiety. It's a key part of the circuit that detects and processes uncertain threats. It detects the perception, I guess this is right, of an uncertain threat. You're mulling around, you're going to be visiting your home family for a holiday and it's always tough on you, that, that this the bed nucleus would be the thing that's activated to sort of be the hub that stirs that thing up. But it's not the explanation, it's part of the explanation, but not the explanation for that subjective feeling state of chronic anxiety. Next one. And it may explain why chronic anxiety is so hard to read in yourself. Uh, it's a different system. Fear is pretty easy to read in yourself. When you're afraid, man, you feel it, right? But if you're chronically anxious, you can be kind of unaware of that until maybe you get a symptom. And then you think, well, God, was I more anxious than I realized? Um, and it just could be that these two systems are can account for that difference. And, uh, but as we know, sort of always having an eye out for the presence of chronic anxiety within self and within others, you can begin to get better at that. And, uh, but that's obviously very valuable as a motivator to pay attention more closely to what's going on. Okay, so next one. So subjectivity requires more stuff. So the assumption that conscious experience is cognitively de derived from non-conscious processes, that conscious experience is cognitively derived from non-conscious processes. You can't have one without the other. Panksepp makes that point very well. If you disconnect the conscious from the non-conscious, subcortical from the cortical, the, co the, the conscious doesn't work anymore. It needs the subcortical areas to be part of the picture, but that doesn't necessarily explain the subjective experience or conscious experience, which is part of subjective experience, of course. So it, it allows the, the cortical regions to represent lower order information the feeling system. And this re-representation, re meaning it was represented at subcortically, now it's being re-represented cortically, uh, enables the con conscious awareness of non-conscious processing about external stimuli. Again, that seems so much in line with how Bowen defined the feeling system. The feeling system can put you help you be aware of superficial aspects of emotional system functioning. And I think that's what they're describing there. They don't use the word superficial, but the cortical processes they're documenting can help you be aware of what's going on 
in lower order information. Not all of it, of course, but enough to be adaptive, it seems. Well, we're not adapting very well these days, so I don't know how quite to explain that beyond regression. But so now conscious awareness is what allows us to become and really process non-conscious uh, thing, non-conscious responses to external stimuli. Like where you, I've often given the example, watching my mother at the top of the stairs put her hand to her forehead and slump down, and then, then watching my behavior in response to that. And then, but I had not been aware before that and systems thinking provided that ability to be aware that this uh, this external stimulus of her body posture and facial expressions were uh, getting represented subjectively as anxiety, but I didn't I didn't make the link until then. Okay, next one, please. So. They propose that subjective feelings are not the products of subcortical circuits, as I've been saying, underlying defensive responses, but depend on the same circuits that underlie any form of conscious experience. So there's nothing unique, according to them, in the circuits that allow you to have subjective experience <clears throat> versus ordinary sensory experience, such as... Uh, or just visual, taking in visual information, what have you, and, and bringing that into consciousness. Same circuits. And, uh, and these can involve not only the prefrontal cortex, but the parietal and temporal lobes. Next slide. Which if you're not familiar with these terms, you can see on the picture of the brain to the left side, you see the frontal lobe facing the two researchers. And then behind that lobe is the parietal lobe and temporal lobe. And apparently all those areas have important influences on consciousness. And I think what Bowen theory would call the intellectual system. It's not just the prefrontal lobes, but other areas of the brain itself involved in thinking, reasoning, and reflection. Um, so I, did I read that whole thing? I can't remember. Okay, so we'll go to the next. Uh, and then this test emphasizes, again, that the lateral and medial prefrontal cortex, again, we're looking at a section of the brain, so we're looking at the middle of the brain, what it looks like when the two halves are separated. Both the lateral uh, parts and medial parts, so outside on the side you can't see, but inside uh, that part of the prefrontal cortex, as well as a structure called the insula, which is shown in the right-hand diagram that exists between the parietal lobe fissure and the temporal lobe. And that's an important uh, structure that allows us to experience somatic sensations. And this was new to me to have them phrase it this way, that interoceptive stimuli, stimuli coming from within the body, can trigger anxiety. And uh, I'm watching a dog of mine with a chronic neurodegenerative disorder slowly uh, get worse with that. And it seems to clearly have an effect on his sort of way of being and his, maybe even his mental state. Um, and I'm thinking that the insula, and dogs have insulas just like we do, is probably the structure that's becoming activated by trouble in the periphery, degenerative process going on, in motor neurons and his hindquarters. And then that's sending that information north 
uh, into uh, it can trigger anxiety, which is the word they use for the more distal, more uncertain, not immediate uh, threat. Uh, so those um, two areas are very important in conscious experience. Next ones, please. So there's a leading theory. There's, I guess, two major theories, but one of the, I think, better accepted ones of how neural architecture gives rise to conscious experience is called higher order theory. Next one. So subjective experience rises from activity of the prefrontal hub. So what's going on in the prefrontal cortex is critical to the whole operation, which supports the thoughts you have about lower order information. And that's what the process of differentiation really is about internally, the ability to think about lower order information and the uh, subjective experience of that that you pick up from the feeling system, just as Bowen described it. And that's, that's the prefrontal hub is key. And uh, I think that's why people like uh, uh, John Hewlings Jackson, the neurologist, saw the prefrontal cortex as key to the evolution of a self. And that's not just the feeling of self, but it has to do with this kind of thing that can give you the capacity for self-regulation. Uh, next one. So conscious awareness of threats comes about in the same way as conscious awareness of non-emotional stimuli. In other words, these circuits involved in uh, uh, tr uh, triggers to that feel threatening are activating the same circuits involved in consciousness, conscious awareness of non-emotional stimuli, an innocent sensation, for example, that comes in. Um, if that's important, I just found that interesting. It's the same circuits and putting the emphasis on how much cortical process is um, involved. I'm going to have to come over here and push my slides. And because uh, our dog is starting to act up down there. I don't have too many more to go. So subcortical circuits can contribute indirectly to feeling states, such as acute anxiety, by affecting brain and body arousal. But it's an indirect effect. Again, and the subcortical is not really responsible for the subjective state. Now I'm going to close with this uh, description of a experiment that I have found just very intriguing done by Sally Boyson. And this is probably the one people will have the most to say in the discussion period. She's a well-known chimpanzee researcher. And um, so she decided to um, can't get the slide to go. Okay, um, to did an experiment with she had a chimp in a cage, and she brings over two plates with treats on them. Uh, the treats weren't identified in the article, and. It's the real treats. And on one plate, there's, say, more, many more treats. Let's say five treats. And on the other plate, there's one treat. And these chimps have been educated to the point that they know how to point to indicate what they want. So the chimp points at the plate with the most treats. And then the researcher is instructed, if the chimp does that, to go to the adjacent cage and give those treats to the chimp in the adjacent cage, frustrating the one who you first offered them to. So they kept doing this, and they did hundreds of trials, and the chimps could never learn to quit pointing at the five, and even though they always got the one, 
So then these chimps had been treated, had been uh, trained to deal with simple numbers, as many chimps have been, so they could, you know, use these symbols. And so they put a number, say, five on one plate and a number one on the other plate. They didn't put the real treats. And the chimps very quickly learned to point to the one and not the five. And um, the way I interpret that, and I think they did too, is that in the presence of the actual treat, the emotional stimulus just dictated what the chimp was going to do. But when given the chance to represent it symbolically and process that information on a higher cognitive level, the chimp was able to self-regulate and eventually get the chimps. And I thought, how is that different from differentiation of self? That's what we're trying to do is to use symbolic constructs in a way. I mean, the triangle describes a process that you can factually describe in the real world, but it's still a construct. And my impression about differentiation of self is you have this construct in your head available for information processing. So when that stimulus comes in and you can use your cortical brain to recognize the subjective response for what it is and then link it to what the other person is doing or not doing and at the same time have the appreciation to think about, now what am I doing to bring this out in the other, which is reciprocity. And that is a more neutral way. I think that's what reduces the threat. In this case, the threat or the, the pull was instant gratification, which is another type of thing that can overload the cortex, cortical process. So I thought the, the uh, chimp research was quite relevant to um, to Bowen theory and a pretty good model. I'm not proposing that chimps could be taught to differentiate a self, but they have some capability to increase their level of self-regulation if they can bring symbols. And I know um, Baudou was big on this, that the evolution of language may have greatly enhanced a human being's ability to to process subjectivity at a conscious level. The language provides more neutral symbols and out of sight of the actual stimulus. You can think about it. And uh, of course you can think about a situation and get all worked up too, but uh, ideally you can think about it and reflect on it and begin to understand the reciprocity better.